الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وله الحمد في الآخرة وهو الحكيم الخبير والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث إلى كافة الورى بشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته أئمة الهدى ومصابيح الدجا الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا داود إنا جعلناك خليفة في الأرض صلوا على محمد وعلى محمد We respected elders, brothers and sisters in Islam Salaamu alaykum wa rahmatullah Yesterday I said that the Quran mentions 26 prophets by name and it also briefly refers to three other prophets without mentioning their names and I said that Insha'Allah, during the course of these lectures, I will be examining some of these stories relating to the Prophets as mentioned in the Qur'an. And in particular, I will be trying to choose those topics and those stories that we can use to help us increase in our spirituality in this holy month of Ramadan. Stories that we can relate to and we can apply in our lives in this modern world. And inshallah, I will be trying to do this with an aim to not only be more acquainted with these great prophets, but also to help us understand the great book of Allah. When we can match the verses of the Quran with spirituality in this holy month, then really we will be going a long way towards achieving the philosophy of fasting and worshipping in this month which is the attainment of taqwa. And so we said that actually the Quran itself points to the importance of the stories of the prophets. The Quran in verse number 111 of Surah Yusuf tells us لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةٌ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ Indeed, in their stories, meaning the stories of the prophets, there is ibra, there is morals, and there, there are morals and lessons for those who possess intellect. Of course, these great prophets are exemplars for us. They embody those characteristics that we should aspire to. And therefore, we can use them as our role models. And inshallah, they will be those great sources of inspiration for us in this holy month. For they went through so many trials and tribulations, and yet they remain committed to that mission of serving Allah and guiding people and helping others to get closer to Allah. Therefore, when we read their stories, they really inspire us and they move our hearts deeply. And therefore, inshallah, tonight we will be looking at yet another of these great prophets. And tonight, inshallah, we will be examining the story of Nabi Dawood ala Nabina wa alihi wa alayhi salam. Salu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So just as a very brief background like I've been doing in the past as well with regards to these prophets, just to have an overview about the prophet that we are discussing. So Nabi Dawood or Prophet David as he's known in English was when he was very young, he was part of King Saul's army and he fought in that army of King Saul or Talut as he's known in Arabic. Then, of course, he kills Goliath, or Jalut, as he's known in English, who Jalut was the leader of the Copts, the Egyptians, 
who had seized Jerusalem and they had destroyed the people there and the Israelites uh, in Jerusalem. So now Dawood is made the king of the Israelites. Also, we are told in traditions that actually he was a great worshipper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He fasted every other day. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes him the, not only a king of the Israelites, but also their prophet. So now Dawood is sent the Psalms or the Zabur. In, in Arabic, actually, the word Zabur simply means book. And this was a book that was revealed to Dawood. And it was a book that did not contain any new laws. For indeed, Nabi Dawood and his people were bound to follow the laws of Nabi Musa ala Nabina wa alihi wa alayhi salam. So there weren't any new laws in Zabur, but it contained epic stories. It contained praise of Allah and it contained du'as and supplications. Now, when we look at the verses of the Quran, we read this amazing part of his story. And that is how he would recite the verses of Zabur. When he would recite the verses of Zabur, he would do so so beautifully that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the mountains and the birds join in with him. He made the mountains and the birds also praise him while Dawood was exalting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and doing the tasbih of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are told this, for example, in a few places, but one example is in Surah Al-Anbiya, verse number 79, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَسَخَّرْنَا مَعَ دعود وَسَخَّرْنَا مَعَ دعود الجبال يُسَبِّحْنَا وَالطَّهِرْ so what that means is that we made with Dawood the mountains and the tayr, the birds, praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So look at this. How is this possible that Allah makes so-called inanimate objects, lifeless objects, praise Him with one of His great servants? I would like to examine this in more detail tonight. And inshallah, then we'll go on to mention some other aspects of Nabi Dawood's life and see what lessons we can gain from this. How is it possible, first of all, therefore, that Allah enables these so-called lifeless, inanimate things to praise Him? And what is the significance of this for us today, inshallah? Salu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Well, when we look at this, we see that indeed all th things that have been created, they have a level of awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not just that, but they praise Him and they worship Him. So we are told in the verses of the Quran that everything has an awareness appropriate to its level of creation. At the highest level are human beings. We have the highest awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we have the highest level of recognition of Allah. And therefore our worship is meant to be at that highest level as well. But all these other things, all these inanimate, lifeless things that we see all around us, they also have a level of awareness and therefore they also praise Allah according to that level that they have been created. So, for example, we are told in Surah Isra, verse number 44, There is nothing, nothing, nothing at all, except that it praises Allah, it glorifies His praise. However, you don't understand the tasbih. Just because we don't understand the tasbih and how they're doing it and when they're doing it and in what form it doesn't mean it's not happening but in certain situations with certain people they are able to acknowledge this and to witness this happening at first hand 
So the verses clearly tell us everything is doing this anyway. However, not only all things have this awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and praise Him, but they also have an awareness of His great servants. This is something truly remarkable. Not only with regards to Allah do they have awareness of and they worship, they praise Him, but they also have an awareness of those people who are close to Allah, such as Nabi Dawood, such as the other prophets, such as the Aima alayhi salam, and even great pious people, which we'll come to later on. So how does this work now? Why was it that when Nabi Dawood would read the Psalms and the Zabur, that these inanimate objects would join him? What happens therefore when we also worship Allah and we do those du'as and supplications in this holy month, for example? Are other things also joining us when we are doing our praise and our exaltation of Allah or not? If not, why not? Let's examine this in some detail, inshallah. Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa Muhammad. Well, we are told in our traditions about these inanimate things, having an awareness of Allah's servants and those who are close to Him. I'll give you some examples and then we'll go into the analysis of, of this whole issue. You might have come across a pillar in the holy mosque of Rasulul Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Which is known as the pillar of Hanana. In the holy masjid in Medina, there are these pillars in the place known as the Rawda. The Rawda is that area of Masjid al Nabi between the holy grave of Rasulullah and his member. I'm sure many of you have visited that place. Often people will go there and they will supplicate and worship Allah over there. And in that place, in that Rawda, which it translates as garden, because it's reported in our traditions that it is one of the gardens of heaven, it's a piece of heaven if you like. There are these pillars and these pillars are also marked by certain names and these names refer to stories behind why they were why they are called as they are called so one of these is known as the pillar of hanana first of all what does hanana mean hanana refers to the cry of a she camel when she is yearning for her calf so it's a sense of yearning it's taken from when a she camel yearns for a calf with a cry. And it was called this because of a very specific incident that transpired in the life of the Holy Prophet. So the Holy Prophet, when he would deliver his sermons in the early days, would lean on a date tree when he was delivering these sermons. He would just slightly lean on this date tree. Now, as the years passed and the congregation became bigger and bigger, there was a need for a pulpit to be made, a mimbar, so that he could now deliver his sermons from that mimbar and more people could see him and hear him. So when this pulpit was made and he started delivering his sermons from the pulpit instead of leaning against that tree, that tree let out a cry. It let out a cry because it felt the pain of being separated away from the holy existence of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So then the Holy Prophet, he hears this as to others and he instructs for this tree to be chopped down and to be buried right in that spot. And this is why now today when we visit the holy mosque, we see that place and there's a pillar there and it's marked the pillar of Hanana. So that's the story behind it. But what is the significance of this in relation to the story of Nabi Dawood and this whole concept of inanimate things, not only having an awareness of Allah and praising Allah, but of also His true and sincere servants. Well, it tells us that these things which are so-called lifeless, 
But they all have this awareness of those who are close to Allah as well. Otherwise that tree would not have acknowledged the Holy Prophet's presence and would not have felt this pain and let out that cry. Just like the verse tells us, everything on the earth and in the heavens, everything that has been created extols his praise even though we don't understand that. So that's one example. Another example can be seen from a tradition from Imam Jafar al-Sadiq The Holy Imam points to what happened after the tragic events of Karbala. And he says, with reference to Sayyid al-Shuhada Aba Abdullah al-Husayn that after his martyrdom, Everything in the heavens and the earth mourned him. Then the Imam goes on to explain that everything in between the heavens and earth also mourned him. Big and small, there wasn't a single thing that did not cry and mourn the martyrdom of Sayyidu Shuhada. How is that possible? It can only be possible if these things have an awareness not only of Allah, but those who are close to Allah. That's two examples. A third example also from our traditions. We are told by Rasul al-Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he addresses Abu Dhar, he says, Oh Abu Dhar, know that whenever a believer passes away, the earth cries for him for 40 days. And we know that, right, from our teachings, when we mark 40 days, we know that during that period of time, even the earth is crying for a, a true mu'min, a true believer. So now we went from everything praising Allah to everything having this acknowledgement and awareness of his close servants, such as the Prophet, but also ordinary mu'mineen, Believers, if they have left this world, the earth, for example, cries for them as well. How can that happen if these things don't have an awareness, don't have a relationship, don't have an acknowledgement for these, uh, for these people? Another example is again from Imam Jafar al-Sadiq He tells us that Mu'allim al-Khayr a teacher of good, when, a te when there's a teacher of good, then everything in the heavens and earth, even the fish in the sea, they seek forgiveness for him. Allahu Akbar. So all of you who are teachers of madrasa or other places, or even if you're not teach teachers in terms of your profession, but you teach someone something good, it benefits them in whatever capacity, then know that everything is seeking forgiveness for you, even the fish in the sea. Again, he's telling us that these inanimate objects have this awareness of people who have this closeness to Allah. They're doing something good. A final example, this one from Rasul al-A'adham sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says that in fact, even a seeker of knowledge, a seeker of knowledge, when he's seeking true knowledge, Allah's, the, all the beings in the heavens of earth seek forgiveness for him. Big and small, whatever is there in the heavens and earth. Allahu Akbar. So we have not only they uh, inanimate objects recognizing and having an awareness of Allah, but also of His prophets, also of mu'mineen, teachers of good, of seekers of knowledge. What is the overall conclusion we can get from all of this discussion? Well, there are some amazing, inspirational conclusions we can gain from this that can help us in our self-building, especially in this holy month. First of all, the fact that the closer somebody is to Allah, the more all of his creation 
will be praying for that person. The closer we get to Allah, that's why the prophets and the imams, they had everything praying for them. That's why Nabi Dawood, when he recited so beautifully, the Psalms, all the mountains and the birds would join in. The closer someone is to Allah, the more these things will be praying for that person, will be seeking forgiveness for that person, will be joining in that praise and that worship with that person. Just imagine the implications of this. When we are, inshallah, especially in the nights of Qadr that are coming up from tomorrow night onwards, when we are engaged in our worship and in our praising of Allah, in doing our tasbih, in doing our tahmeed, in doing our takbir, we should have this acknowledgement that perhaps if our worship is of that level of sincerity, then everything else in the entire creation will be joining us as well. We are not alone in this. What a humbling thought for us to know that inshallah, if we reach that level of purity of worship, of sincerity of worship, everything else will also be joining us in our worship. It is so humbling for us to know that. And it gives us that extra inspiration and motivation, inshallah, during these nights of Qadr. Also, another conclusion we get from this is that we are able to affect what is around us. Not only people that we think, yes, well, they can understand what we are saying, so yes, we can affect them, surely, and through our actions and our words. But no, even through our worship, we are able to affect all things that are around us. Again, that tells us the power of a human being, the power that his soul can possibly have. And this is why, inshallah, when we recite our supplications and engage in all of those acts of worship, especially on the nights of Qadr, we should bear this in mind and raise, inshallah, our level of worship. Salu ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. So these were just some things relating to the blessed life of Nabi Dawood, in particular with regards to how was it and why was it that all of the mountains and the birds joined him when he was re reciting the verses of Zabur so beautifully. But now I would like to move on to a very important story that is mentioned to us with regards to Nabi Dawood in the Quran. And that concerns the whole area of not jumping to conclusions. So this is something, like I said, I'm trying to select those stories of the prophets which can really help us in the modern world to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of these things is to know that we must not jump to conclusions, meaning we should not judge or make decisions without knowing all the facts. Unfortunately, this happens quite a lot in our community and in the wider community as well. People being very hasty to judge people or situations or circumstances, whatever it might be without knowing the facts and all of the surrounding information to make an informed decision. This is something that is very important. What does the story of Nabi Dawood teach us about this? First of all, let's briefly look at the story. It's mentioned in Surah Saad, verses 21 to 24. In these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us of this very important incident that takes place in the life of Nabi Dawood. So in order to test his great prophet, he sends down two angels. These two angels are disguised as parties that are having a dispute. Walaikum <laughs> salam wa rahmatullah. So they, first of all, Nabi Dawood is in his sanctuary. Like I said, he was a very devout worshiper of Allah to the extent that he would fast every other day. So he's worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his sanctuary. These two angels in the form of human beings, they scale the wall of his sanctuary and they appear before him all of a sudden. Of course, 
Prophet David is frightened when he sees this and they say to him that don't be afraid. We are having this dispute and we would like you to judge between us justly. So Nabi Dawood is listening to their dispute. One of them says that I am the owner of 99 sheep and he is the owner of one sheep. And the one who is, who is uh, the owner of one sheep, he's saying that the other one, he describes him as his brother, my brother is, is demanding that even this one sheep that I have, I should give it to him. He already owns 99, but he also wants this one sheep that I own. Now, let's put ourselves in this situation and try to relate to this. Or perhaps the last time that we were a little bit too quick to jump the gun and to come to a very hasty conclusion. What would we do in this situation? What did we do in the past in that situation that perhaps we have in our minds? Let's just try and think about this for a second. Well, Nabi Dawood, he was always a defender of the oppressed. He always wanted to support those who were downtrodden. And so he says that your brother is being unjust. Now, as soon as he says that, he realizes his mistake. What was his mistake? He didn't hear the other side of the story. He immediately said, he assumed that this brother who's demanding that one sheep also goes to him is being unjust. And so he says that, yes, he's being unjust. But he was jumping to conclusions. He didn't hear all the facts and all the surrounding information about this incident. Immediately he realizes his mistake. And so he begins to repent to Allah. He goes down in such that even. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, look at his mercy towards those of his servants who are sincere and admit their mistakes. This is very important for us to bear in mind. Yes, we will make mistakes, but first of all, we must admit to our mistakes. Allah regards this as being very, very high. Admitting your mistakes, then seeking repentance. Allah, inshallah, will forgive us for all our mistakes, inshallah. Amen. And by the way, with regards to Nabi Dawood, just as an issue of theology and Aqidah, it was not a sin that we can even question his isma. We say that all the prophets were ma'asum. They never make, they never commit any sins. This was not a sin. At the most we say it's known as tarqul awla. Not doing what, what was better. It doesn't mean it was a sin. Allah was simply testing him. It wasn't a case of halal and haram. It was a very safe situation where he was able to make mistakes very similar to the mistake that Nabi Adam Allah Nabi wa made when he was expelled from that place. So it was a safe situation. It wasn't a matter of halal and haram. It was something that was used as a test to help these great prophets grow in stature and to get even higher in the estimation of Allah and then we'll see what his reward was afterwards in, in a few moments time. So there's no question of him you know, committing a sin or not uh, being infallible at all. Anyway, as the story progresses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately forgives him and not only that, he raises him to an even higher station. My brothers and sisters, these are all important lessons for us. Yes, we must try and avoid all mistakes. Yes. But at the end of the day, we will make mistakes. The key thing to do though is to admit them, to seek repentance and to resolve not to do them again. Inshallah, Allah will raise us even higher than before. So what is the verse that now comes in the Quran, it's verse number 26 of Surah Sa'ad. Look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses his great prophet. He says, Ya Dawood, he calls him by name, Inna ja'alnaka khalifatan fil ard. Oh my great prophet, 
We have now made you our Khalifa, our representative, our vicegerent on the earth. Fahkum bainan nasi bil haq. So now that you have learned your lesson, now judge between the people justly. It's okay, you made that mistake. You've learned from it. You have been raised high and now judge how you should be judging. And do not follow your whims and desires. Otherwise, your desires will keep you away from the path of God. Now, you see what's happened here and what lessons we can gain from this. When, inshallah, we repent, we are raised higher, then Allah wants us to do things properly. Judge properly. Do not jump to conclusions. Do not follow your desires. Otherwise, your desires will take you away from the path of Allah. Salaam ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So now, let me just begin to wrap this lecture up by pointing to a couple of stories that I came across about what the effects, the negative effects of judging and jumping to conclusions has for, for us. I came across this very touching story that I found just today, in fact. It was concerning a 10-year-old boy some years ago, mm -hmm. who goes into an ice cream parlor and he asks the waitress there uh, for an ice cream sundae, mm -hmm. okay? And he asks her, how much, is, how much is this ice cream sundae? And she says, well, it's 50 cents. Okay, a few years ago, it's 50 cents. Mm -hmm. So then he pulls out a whole load of loose change, all these nickels and dimes and pennies and quarters, and you can just imagine what that waitress was thinking, right? They, this guy is going to take all my time for one Sunday. He starts counting them very carefully, and she's obviously feeling really frustrated about this. But then he says that, now can you tell me how much is just a plain ice cream? And she's really getting upset now. And she says to him in a very annoyed tone, well, a plain ice cream would be 35 cents. Again, he starts counting all this loose change, taking his time, counting it very carefully. So then he says that, actually, I will have the plain ice cream, not the sundae. So she brings it to him. After about 10 minutes, she comes back and the boy has disappeared. He's gone. And so she, she thinks that, you know, thank God that he's gone. He's not asking for anything else. Because obviously she has other people to serve as well. So she takes away the plate. As she does so, she spots something that the boy has left under the plate. You know what he left behind? He left behind two nickels and five penny coins, 15 cents. And she couldn't believe it. Because the boy, he could have afforded that Sunday, the 50 cents ice cream, he didn't want that because he wanted the cheaper ice cream in order to leave the waitress a tip. So now, just imagine how she must have felt. Wow. Jumping to conclusions. This is what happens, my brothers and sisters. We don't know what people have in their hearts. We don't know what they intend. We don't know what they will be doing while we are trying to conjure up all of these possibilities and our conjectures and our surmises, what do we know about what is hidden? And therefore, we must be very careful not to jump to conclusions. Another story that I have came across before, it involves a builder. This is a very important lesson for us that in fact, what is even worse than jumping to conclusions, at least that waitress didn't do anything in her actions, didn't really say anything uh, or do anything that really harmed that boy. But sometimes we actually take steps and we act upon the foregone conclusions, the presuppositions. That is even worse. Look at this. 
So there was this builder and he was down on his luck. And so there was a friend of his who wanted to help him out. And he says to him that, look, if you build for me a house, a very beautiful house, I'll give you the money, I'll give you the budget, then you will see that I will reward you in a very handsome way. So this builder is very happy, but he knows that he can make even more out of this if he uses his budget in a very, in a very stingy way. So what he does is, he tries to buy all the, the, the cheapest materials possible to build this house. So all the bricks and the mortar and the timber and everything, he goes for the cheapest options. He wants to save money so that he can make even more out of this idea. So when it comes to the plumbing, for example, again, the cheapest possible options. When it comes to the electric works, he cuts corners all over the place. But he tries to make the appearance of it very nice so that the owner would not understand what he's done. So after he's completed the house, he goes to the owner and he tells him that, here are the keys to the house. I built you it, I hope you're happy. The owner, he looks at the house and he sees that, yes, apparently it really does look beautiful. And he says, wow, you've done a great job not knowing how many corners this person has actually cut. So now this guy is waiting for his reward. So now that owner, he says, I am going to be loyal to my promise. I said that I will reward you handsomely if you make me a beautiful house and you've done that. So now your reward is as follows. He takes those keys and he gives it to that builder. The same house that that builder had made by cutting all those corners and doing the cheapest job possible ended up being his reward. So now, you see my brothers and sisters, jumping to conclusions. And unfortunately, in this case, even acting upon those conjectures that we have about situations, about others. At least in that first story, that waitress didn't really do anything. But in the second story, he jumped to conclusions and he acted very hastily based on what he thought would be the situation. He thought the reward would be something else. It ended up coming back and haunting him. Salu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. But we also should put forward some practical tips as to how we can stop jumping to conclusions. Just a few practical things that I've gained through the course of some research I've done in this top in this area. The first thing that we can do in order to stop ourselves from jumping to conclusions and making hasty judgments and decisions without knowing all the facts is recognizing the fact that we are doing this. In fact, it's actually a psychological illness if it gets to a certain level of extremity. In any case, Recognizing it is the first step. After that, another thing that we can do is to make sure that we are putting forward at least five other possibilities to what the truth could be. Let's try and do that. So, somebody, we've sent somebody an important email, we sent them a text message, whatever the case might be, and they haven't responded. Usually they respond quite quickly, but it's been a day, two days, three days, a week, whatever the case might be. I'm sure we've all been in this situation. And we start jumping to conclusions. We start putting forward all sorts of possible reasons. Oh, it's because, you know, he no longer wants me to do this thing. He no longer likes me. He's got something against me. All of these often negative conclusions. Let's, inshallah, try to put at least five other possibilities as to why that, that thing hasn't happened. This will also help us. And then, even with those five possibilities, we keep them simply as that, possibilities. We don't make any foregone conclusions unless we go to step three. And that is to find out more about the situation. Facts. Let's investigate before we judge, before we come to foregoing decisions and conclusions. Find out what is the situation. 
Ask questions rather than make decisions. How often do we want to make decisions rather than ask questions? Let's ask questions, find out, gain knowledge, and then we will see whether or not the situation is what we thought it was or, or it was something else. Often, there is a very good logical reason as to why something hasn't happened. Another tip is to always be patient. Often, simply having the patience to let that situation run the course of, of, of time and just roll out in its own way. We often see afterwards that actually what I had in mind was nothing like the reality. Just be patient. Let it roll out in its own time and we will inshallah see what the reality was. And fifthly and finally, a tip to help us stop jump to, uh, jumping to conclusions is to always perform our duties to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just focus on that. It's, it's you and your Lord. Just like in that case of that builder, all he needed to do was to perform his duty properly and sincerely. Build the house as it should have been built and he would have been fine. He would have got a brilliant, strong house in return for his reward. He didn't do his duty. He tried to go beyond the boundaries of what his responsibilities and what his duties were. And therefore he suffered in that way. Let's also make it a point to just do things for the sake of God. It's between us and Allah. As long as Allah is happy with what we are doing, with how we are thinking, inshallah that should be sufficient. He will look after all of our affairs. So as a conclusion, as we bring this lecture to a close, today we looked at the story of another great prophet in the Quran. The Prophet David, Nabi Dawood. And we saw some things about his life and we went on to mention how when he recited the, 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 the Psalms in such a beautiful voice, the mountains and the birds joined in with him. We then went on to explain how this is possible and why when he recited the verses, it's because everything has an awareness of not only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not only do, does everything worship Allah, but also everything has an awareness of His great servants. The closer somebody is to God, the more everything, even these so-called inanimate, lifeless things, have an awareness about that person. They will, as we saw from the traditions and stories, they will praise that person, they will seek forgiveness for that person, and they will pray for that person as well. Then we went on to look at this whole idea of not jumping to conclusions, as illustrated in the story of Prophet David, how he was able to rise even further and closer to Allah by admitting his mistakes, by seeking forgiveness, and learning from his mistakes. We too can also do that, and we can do that by inshallah taking up those five practical tips that I referred to earlier. Let's re re recite a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, O oh Allah, enable us to always judge people and situations having known all the facts surrounding that instance, inshallah. O oh Allah, enable us to follow in the footsteps of the great prophets mentioned in the Quran. O oh Allah, enable us to live and die according to the teachings of the Quran and Yahweh Bay. O oh Allah, there are many people facing difficulties around the world. Grant them relief. O oh Allah, forgive us and our forefathers for our sins. And O oh Allah, our last but not least prayer is that you hasten the appearance of the 12th Holy Imam. Ajjalallahu ta'ala faraju sharif. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.